Order members, members resume their seat. The next item in the order paper is a legislative consent motion for medicines and medical device bill. I will ask the clerk to read the motion. This Assembly endorses the principle of the extension to Northern Ireland of the provisions within the Medicines and Medical Devices Bill as introduced to Parliament on 13 February 2020, dealing with human medicines and vet veterinary medicines. I call the Minister of Health to move the motion. I beg to move. Thank you, Minister. The Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate. And I invite the Minister to open the debate on the motion. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm aware that the Assembly's Standing Order 42A provides that this legislative consent motion shall not normally be moved until at least either five working days after publication of the committee report or 20 working days after the date of referral to the committee. I realise in this instance the provisions of the Standing Order have not been met. However, it was necessary to move the motion today in order to ensure the debate took place before the Medicines and Medical Devices Bill reaches its reporting stage in the House of Commons, which we were advised was likely to be on the 18th of June. By way of explanation, I trust that members will appreciate that of recent times none of us have been operating in what we would call normal circumstances. As has been the case with the work of the Assembly, the reality is that many aspects of the work of the Northern Ireland Civil Service Departments, and in particular my own, have had to put on hold over the past number of months because of the need to prioritise our responses to the COVID-19 outbreak. Indeed, work on tackling the outbreak has been the complete focus of all our efforts and energy to date. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Medicines and Medical Devices Bill has two main purposes. The first is to provide a mechanism for strengthening and maintaining the regulatory system for medicines, both human and veterinarian, clinical trials and medical devices after the UK leaves the European Union and secondly, to consolidate the enforcement framework relating to medical devices and to introduce a new civil sanction regime. From a Northern Ireland perspective, the provisions within the Medicines and Medical Devices Bill that deal with human medicines and veterinary medicines are transferred matters, and as such fall within the legislative competence of the Northern Ireland Assembly. A legislative consent motion is therefore required to allow Westminster to legislate for these provisions. Responsibility for matters relating to human medicines falls under the responsibility of my department, while slows that deal with veterinary medicines are within the remit of my executive colleague, Mr Edwin Putz, at the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Those provisions within the bill that deal with medical devices are reserved matters, as such lie outside the legislative competency of the Northern Ireland Assembly. The regulations of medicines, clinical trials and veterinary medicines has been a matter of European Union competence since the UK joined the European Union. The existing legislative frameworks are provided in the following regulations. The Human Medicines Regulation 2012, the Veterinary Medicines Regulations 2013, Medical Devices Regulation 2002, and the Medicines for Human Use Clinical Trials Regulations 2004. The EU Directive relating to medicinal products for human use has been transported, or sorry, transposed into UK law by the Human Medicines Regulations 2012, which set standards to protect public health and ensure that medicines are safe and effective. The regulations covering the licensing, manufacture, advertising, labelling, distribution, sale and supply of medical products in the UK. They also set rules governing which products can be prescribed, stored and administered by spe specified professionals in specified settings. In an equivalent way, the EU Clinical Trials Directive, which regulates clinical trials involving human medicines, is transposed into UK law by the Medicines for Human Use Clinical Trials Regulations 2004. And similarly, the EU Directive relating to vet veterinary med medical products has been transposed into UK law by the Veterinary Medicines Regulations 2013, which set out the UK controls on veterinary medicines including their manufacture, advertising, marketing, supply and administration. These regulations also set rules governing which products can be prescribed, stored and administered by specified professionals in specified settings. The UK Government currently has powers to amend these various regulations by means of subordinate legislation, which is made under powers contained within the Section 2.2 of the European Community Act 1972. 
However, the problem is that by operation of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018, at the end of the transition period, Section 2.2 of the European Communities Act 1972 will be revoked and the powers will no longer be able to be used to allow us to make amendments by subordinate legislation. Therefore, it is necessary to maintain the ability to amend these regulatory frameworks once the UK has ceased to have recourse to use the Section 2.2 power in the European Communities Act at the end of the transition period. It is therefore vital that we have a legislative mechanism in place that will provide us with a delegated power to make any changes to the regulation by means of subordinate legislation. The Medicines and Medical Devices Bill seeks to provide the necessary delegated powers that can be exercised to make changes to the current regulatory framework for medicines, human and veterinary, medical devices and clinical trials by means of subordinate legislation. In relation to the regulation making powers within the Bill, I would like to make it clear to members that subsection 41.4 provides that regulations made by a Northern Ireland Department acting alone are subject to the draft affirmative resolution procedure, which means that they have to be laid before and approved by the Northern Ireland Assembly. The exceptions to this are found in subsections 41.7 and 41.9 that set out when the negative resolution procedure applies, and members will notice that these are limited. I think it is important to make the point that the requirement for the draft affirmative procedure will ensure that the Assembly has the proper opportunity to scrutinise and debate any regulations before they are approved. I would also wish to highlight to members that Clause 40 of the Bill requires that before any reg regulations are made, there has to be consultation with such persons who are deemed appropriate. The only exception to the requirement to consult relates to the circumstances where a regulation is required urgently in order to alleviate a threat of serious harm to the health of the general public or a section of the public. I am, of course, aware that we need to be mindful of business in Northern Ireland in the context of the EU exit and Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. This is an important issue for future access to medicines and medical devices, as well as the potential impact on business. In that context, my officials have had ongoing discussions with colleagues in the UK government about the implications of the protocol, and members will appreciate that those discussions were put on hold because of the need to prioritise our response to COVID-19, but I fully expect that these discussions will soon begin to gather momentum. Mr Deputy Speaker, I trust members will understand the importance for Northern Ireland to be included within the provisions of the Medicines and Medical Devices Bill. It is vital for us to have the necessary delegated powers to replace Section 2.2 of the European Communities Act 1972, and I would ask members to support the motion here today. I now call the Chairperson of the Health Committee, Colm Gildenew. Kainchanish or Hurusk and Hustia, Agus Turami and Kushta Slancha, a Skelu Liv. Uh, I would like to speak to the committee's report and summarise the Health Committee's consideration of this matter. Erdus Baira, Bawailum, Mawahus, Agol, Lesh and Kushta, Talayakta, Temple Akta, Agus Forbarch Tuha, Damaknu Gasta, Agus and Maj, Akora Shade, Lesh and Turisk. May I first of all thank the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Development for its prompt consideration and contribution to the report. I will leave it to my colleague, the Chair of the Committee, to address the issues around veterinary medicines. The Minister of Health wrote to the Health Committee on 1 April, advising of the need for the legislative consent motion. The memorandum was laid on 27 May and department, departmental officials briefed the Committee on 4 June 2020. On 2 June, the Committee invited the Committee on Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs to submit its views in relation to Part 2 of the Bill, Veterinary Medicines. Department of Health officials briefed the Health Committee on the background to the Bill and on the nature of the powers to be provided to the Department under Part 1, Human Medicines. As the Minister outlined and as officials have advised the Committee, the relevant provisions were essentially of an enabling nature, providing replacement powers to make delegated legislation once Section 2, Subsection 2 of the European Communities Act is repealed at the end of December. Members were assured that, on that basis, the regulations to be made under the provisions requiring consent 
will come back to the committee for consideration in the usual way and will be subject to the draft affirmative procedure as outlined by the Minister. The committee's attention was drawn to Clause 40, which requires consultation prior to the exercise of powers in relation to both human medicines and veterinary medicines, except in emergencies as referenced above under Clause 6. The committee discussed with officials the scope of the delegated powers, the impact of EU exit and the protocol on Ireland North and South on the matters covered by the Bill, for example, our participation here in the North in EU-wide clinical trials. We also discussed North-South and East-West cooperation and regulatory alignment and the division of powers to be exercised in Britain and here in the North. Officials confirmed that the delegated powers were needed because human medicines regulations are updated regularly, usually twice yearly, and that such updates directly affect prescribing practice. Members inquired about the impact of Brexit in relation to this legislation. Officials confirmed that the area of human medicines is included in the protocol as an area of EU legislation, in respect of which the North will continue to apply certain EU standards. Asked about potential divergence on a North-South basis, officials uh, Officials, asked about the potential divergence on North South basis, officials therefore stated that there was greater risk of divergence between the North and Britain. They also advised that work was ongoing between the Department of Health here, the British Department of Health and Social Care, and the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Authority to reduce that risk. By way of example, the North will be required to comply with EU standards in relation to falsified medications, whereas Britain would be free to diverge. In relation to clinical trials, officials stated that the MHRA would continue to manage this area and that there is an aspiration to maintain a close link with the EU, although discussions are still at an early stage. Officials confirmed that issues around the supply of and access to medicines were being addressed as part of preparatory work ahead of implementing the protocol. The committee inquired if a detailed list could be provided setting out the limits of devolved authority to legislate in terms of the protocol and British government powers. Officials advised that this is a complicated field and that a comprehensive list could not yet be provided, but that officials are working through the issues. Officials did confirm, however, that all areas of the bill address matters that have been within the EU's remit to date. The Chief Pharmaceutical Officer has confirmed that the implementation of the protocol would have implications for human medicines, but while that work is ongoing, it is separate from the bill insofar as the bill provides replacement delegated powers to continue amending human medicines regulation in line with current practice. Tana Hifigi le Pilu er na kustia mac an sio le huastada fan frotocol a hoarch. Officials have undertaken to return to the committee in due course to provide an update on the implementation of the protocol. Before closing as committee chair last kian Corlia, I would like to address the issue of timing. The Health Committee fully acknowledges the Department of Health has been under tremendous pressure to deal with COVID-19. However, limited early engagement and the late laying of the LCM have necessarily had an impact on the Committee's opportunity for scrutiny. The Committee's deadline to report Understanding Order 42A was 17 June, and today's debate should have been scheduled to take place at least five working days after that. The committee was advised by the department, however, that the House of Commons could schedule report stage as early as 18 June, and that therefore debate on the LCM in the Assembly would be scheduled for today. The committee has sought to be as cooperative as possible, but it did not have the opportunity to consider taking evidence from stakeholders due to the time constraints and the focus on COVID-19. In view of the lack of detailed prior engagement on the content of the LCM, the short time frame available for scrutiny of the LCM once laid and the importance of the issues connected to the bill, the committee decided it was not in a position to come to a decision on support for the motion. I trust the issues raised and the report produced will nevertheless aid members in their consideration today. Uh, I'd like to make now a few remarks in relation to my capacity as Sinn Féin spokesperson for health. The widespread uncertainty caused by Brexit is being felt across all aspects of our lives, creating worry about our livelihoods, our health, our education and our futures. The Brexit catastrophe has been foisted upon this society by the worst instincts of extreme British nationalism, an inward-looking exclusionary doctrine that threatens our very way of life here in the North. Ni shina ataan, 
near Chai Pobble and Tushgard vote our son Brexit. This is not who we are. The people of the North did not vote for breakfast, Brexit. Chai Kega is She Fuin Gied, Den Fubble in our Dial Canter, Votai Armweha, Lefanak, Markoj, Denintas Europe, Agassiz Shina, Achai Himoj, Trij, Arason. 56% of the people across our constituencies voted to remain in the European Union and is that majority that we are all tasked to represent. As we stumble through the so-called transition period, it becomes clearer that a potential catastrophic crash out from the European Union could lie ahead. What this will mean for our economy is anyone's guess, but we can be certain that there will be few positives for any of us, as the most optimistic forecast is that the already faltering economy of the North could shrink or will shrink by a further 3 to 8 per cent. We do know that Brexit, and particularly a, a, a crash out Brexit, and a failure to implement pro the protocol will cause widespread disruption to our economy as our manufacturing base, agriculture, agri-food sectors, and all other sectors of our economy could potentially lose access to a market of tens of millions of customers. This will inevitably have an impact on our health service, and that is also a huge concern. There's no certainty on anything at this point because there's no certainty that the Tory government in England will even agree to the very agreement that they made with the European Union in this respect. This is the ludicrous situation we find ourselves trapped in, despite the fact we voted no. We do, know, we do not even know at this stage, in other words, if the protocol will even be implemented. We are now caught in a perfect storm as we find ourselves heading into the worst recession in generations, and after 10 years of Tory austerity that has ravished our public services, we are also faced with a catastrophic, catastrophic disruption of Brexit. Tasha Godona Nar Nieligar, Argora Slancha, Agus Pubel Sagin. That is members bad for our economy, our health service, and our people. I now call the Chairperson of the Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee, Declan McLear. Um, at the era meeting on the 5th of March, uh, we considered a letter from the uh, Minister, the dear Minister, regarding the Medicines and the Medical Devices Bill. The letter noted that the, this is a Westminster uh, Bill and is predominantly focused on human medicines and medical devices, with one section dealing with the veterinary medicines. The LCM was tabled by the Health Minister and referred to the, health, uh, the Committee for Health for consideration. And the committee asked, uh, that committee, the Health Committee asked that the Agriculture, Environment and Affairs Committee consider the comment on part two uh, of the bill as this concerns veterinary medicines. The, um, the ERA Committee took oral and written evidence uh, on the four clauses that make up part two of veterinary medicines on the 11th of June. Uh, this is a complex and technical bill, and we have had limited time to scrutinise it. On behalf of the committee, I want to be clear that due to time constraints, we have not had the opportunity to fully explore the implications uh, of the clauses, nor have we had time to consult with relevant stakeholders. During evidence, one of the first things that uh, we asked officials was about the carryover of the existing regime. We received assurances that after the enactment of the bill, the existing regime developed as part of our membership of the EU would remain largely uh, the same. Uh, the provisions of the bill that deal with veterinary medicines are in part two of the bill. Veterinary medicines are transferred and as such uh, fall uh, within uh, the, legislative uh, the legislative competence of uh, this Assembly. The Era Committee therefore considered Clause 8, which is the power to make regu regu regulations about veterinary medicine, Clause 9, manufacturer marketing, supply and field trials, Clause 10, fees, offences, powers of inspectors and costs, and Clause 11, interruption of Part 2 and supplementary provision. We also considered some of Part 4 of the Bill, specifically around the issues around the making of regulations and the consultation required. The EU Veterinary Medicines Regulation 2013 were made on um, a UK-wide basis and they will be transposed into uh, domestic law uh, when uh, we leave the EU. Deere explained that this is essentially an enabling bill that it does nothing in itself but enables amendments to be made by secondary legislation and that is considered appropriate to retain this flexibility going forward. After the transition period, the bill will allow Deere to amend the Veterinary Medicines Regulations 2013 and this can be done by DERA acting alone or jointly with uh, Westminster. The committee considered the regulation making powers and are content that any changes to the current regime must be subject to the scrutiny of the Assembly, irrespective of whether they are made by DERA acting alone or jointly with uh, Westminster. 
committee are, um, that are also content that most of the changes will be subject to the affirmative resolution uh, procedure. The committee draws attention to the clause 9.2. Uh, under the protocol, this administration must remain aligned with, the e with EU regulations on veterinary medicines. However, the explanatory note to the bill states that clause 9.2 provides the means for making corresponding or similar provision to the new EU regulations as the UK sees fit. We explored this with dairy officials who noted that this refers mainly to new EU regulations coming forward in 2022. Because this jurisdiction must adhere to the protocol and remain aligned with the EU, the provision in Clause 9.2 was unnecessary and is in essence, uh, in essence a dormant power. Dairy officials explained that they indicated uh, to, uh, to Westminster that they would prefer that this was not included and had asked for it to be removed. Deere accepts that this was unlikely to happen and indicated to the committee that they could live with it. Further considerations of this issue by the committee yielded that the only circumstances in which the provision in Clause 9.2 might be used if, if, it, if the Assembly voted in four years to remove the protocol. However, Deere officials noted that even in this scenario it was difficult to see how this power uh, would be exercised because at that point the 2022 EU regulations would have been incorporated into the veterinary medicine regime. The committee is also aware that a common framework is being developed to maintain a consistent and common approach between all of the four jurisdictions uh, in the area of animal health and welfare issues. It is expected this will include the regulation of veterinary medicines post-transition, i.e. after the 31st of December 2020. The committee noted that it had not yet considered the common framework and that this had left a, a gap in knowledge that was unable to address due to a lack of time. Reference was also made to Clause 8.2c, especially in relation to the clarity and in relation to the word attractiveness. Dear officials agreed to provide further clarity on this matter as a matter of urgency. That clarity was received, but it was too late to be included in our written report to the Health Committee. However, in an email to the ERA Committee, Deere stated that it had consulted with the relevant department and, it, uh, which, and the, the response quotes. It notes that the rationale for the relevant provisions is to ensure that before the regulations are made, consideration is given to matters such as barriers to the market and the need to ensure that the UK remains somewhere that manufacturers would want to develop and test human and veterinary medicines and medical devices following the end of the transition period. The UK Department has indicated that the provisions intend to ensure that the whole of the UK can regulate effectively and to reflect the eventual outcome of the UK's future relationship with the EU. I will conclude by saying that at the meeting on the 11th of June, uh, although the committee was extremely unhappy uh, that we did not have time to fully explore, consult and scrutinise, um, uh, scrutinise the, the LCM, um, we, we are content that the LCM is related to the, the with the LCM as related to the veterinary medicines provisions in the bill. And just, just finally, and although Colum Gildini, my colleague, has touched on um, the, many of the issues relating to this anyway, the, uh, I just want to make the point that, again, that this, is a, this, is, this has come about but as a result of Brexit. You know, after the transition period's end, we will see a repeal of the 1974 European Communities Act at the end of the transition period, and this will mean that the uh, Veterinary Medicine Regulation 2013 will no longer have to be aligned with the EU. And again, that, uh, in order to us to avoid a legislative gap here, it's necessary for us to bring in this uh, LCM so we continue to be aligned with the EU as per the protocol. And um, as I said previously, we're not, we're not happy with the lack of scrutiny. And indeed, we're not, we're not happy that the fact that this is another very unfortunate um, by byproduct of a Brexit process that the majority of the people here did not uh, accede to and did not vote for in the pro first, pro first process or in the first place. Grandma I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I rise to support the legislative consent motion. As we continue with the processes associated with leaving the European Union, I suspect we can expect more of these LCMs, an important aspect of the legislative process of taking back control. Mr Deputy Speaker, there's, uh, there is um, a little matter of uh, major controversy in detail of this LCM, and as such, my party and I will be supporting this motion here today. And I also uh, only intend to highlight a couple of issues so to as not unnecessarily delay the proceedings of this House this evening. Firstly, we see the benefits of being able to regulate as an independent nation in an ever-evolving ever -evolving medical world. We see here that free from EU red tape and bureaucracy, we can now act swifter and more decisively in response to new situations. That can only be a good thing. 
both for the purposes of helping those needing treatment, but also those who innovate, research and deliver new products. I also want to address uh, the issues of research relating to medicines and devices. Members will know that in my constituency in South Antrim, we have the world leading Randox Laboratories. This company strives for better, strives to use the world leading research and development they have at their, disposable, at their disposal at considerable costs to lead in the field of medicine and pharmaceuticals. As we look to recover from the impact of COVID-19 and, and how that's impacted on our economy, we need to be supporting firms like Randox, but also the many other local companies in this field. In terms of medicines and devices, we also need to look to support our universities and our local private sector to lead in this field also. Opportunities do exist and we need to take them and ensure that medicines and medical devices are accessed sooner and safer than ever before. Finally, at the core of this debate, we must, must be patient safety. That must never be sacrificed and it would be my hope that rather, rather that safety is enhanced and further enshrined by the legislation before us today. I believe that the bill has potential to go further on patient safety than we could do so under the European Union's framework. So, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, as a party, we will be supporting the proposal to endorse the principle of the extension to Northern Ireland of the provisions in the Medicines and Medical Devices Bill, as introduced at Parliament on 13th of February 2020, dealing with human medicines and veterinary medicines, and believe that it is in the interest of good government and consistency across the UK. Thank you. I call Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise to participate in this legislative consent motion and appreciate that there is a necessity for it. I understand um, from the presentation that was given to us in the Health Committee that officials are aware of the need to have this uh, legislative instrument to be able to take and make crucial and critical decisions down the line. But I am somewhat concerned that the impact of the motion does leave more questions than answers. And when we questioned um, officials at the committee, they were only able to tell us what the specific ramifications of this motion could be. And this has led me to the conclusion that I am unable to actively consent to the motion. However, addressing the need that the officials did mention to us earlier and that they had outlined, uh, I won't actively block this from proceeding either. Um, the LCM is needed, I suppose, ultimately because of Brexit. Um, exit in the European Union is causing a raft of implications um, that impact us well beyond the mantra of taking back control. Again, how we learn that the impact is more in reality than the simplicity of simply three words. Many medical devices and indeed drugs and other pharmaceutical products are regulated by Europe using the combined knowledge, experience and understanding of 28 countries' medical and pharmaceutical experts. Alas, that will be for us no longer, and the UK will have to try and replicate that work and attempt to replicate that experience and skill. Now, with the potential of a no-deal Brexit, the ramifications for future joined-up working could be in jeopardy. But again, Mr Deputy Speaker, the key term is might. It might be. There might be difficulties. Uh, yet again, another industry is subjected to the highs and lows of uncertainty emanating from this badly managed and roughshod Brexit process. And the lack of consultation that one of the other members has referred to in the committee as well, the ability for us to be able to engage with the sector to find out what the ramifications of this process would be, the fact that we weren't able to do that, that is not good practice. That is not a good way of making laws or agreeing to other laws, the fact that we are not able to actually find out what the impact of it would be. So, As a result of all this lack of clarity, um, I do not wish to support this LCM, but due to the importance and urgency of the issue and the dire impact that it will have upon people and industry, I would once again urge the British Government to... Yes, go ahead. I thank the member for giving way. I am hearing a lot of members from the far side of the House talking about the lack of best practice, and I get that. But we've just demonstrated the lack of best practice uh, by approving retrospectively lockdown measures being eased. Uh, in the member's own committee, uh, the executive office has brought retrospectively legislation to be approved by the committee. Nobody at the moment on any committee, statutory committee, is able to fulfil their obligation under section 29 
paragraph 1A, 1 and 2 of a strategy committee, which is to advise and assist ministers of the executive. We're just not able to do it, and I don't think we should be picking on this minister and on this occasion, because it's now the rule that we seem to be applying. For his intervention, and wholeheartedly agree. Uh, and I refer to the previous debate where I said that at every time that I have taken to my feet to speak, I have said that I am unhappy with the process. And should we be given uh, the critical assessment to this minister in this place now? Yes. And we should be doing it every time that we see that laws are being put through this chamber in an imperfect way. Because I think to just simply sit back and accept that without challenging it means that we are not fulfilling the proper job that we are sent to this room to do. And in conclusion, as I say, I think the best way to sort out all of these issues where there is a lack of clarity is for the British Government to swallow its pride and ask for an extension to the transition period so that proper scrutiny and proper consideration can be taken to the impact of these rules which are being stuffed through in London, Edinburgh, uh, in, in Cardiff and here. I just do not think it is perfect at all. I call Paula Bradshaw. Um, thank you, um, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise on behalf of the Alliance Party to support the motion as it is enabling legislation which we will have to pass in some form anyway. As Party Health spokespersons, my remarks will focus on part one, that is clauses one to seven, which concerns medicines, that is to say the aspect of the UK bill which is devolved to Northern Ireland and falls specifically under health. This is, as I said, an enabling bill which affects matters of significant importance. Naturally, as we know only too well, the supply of human medicines is one of the most important issues we have to deal with in our rules, including fees and offences around this and falsification. What this bill does offer is clarity about how this will continue to happen and what our rule will be. Notably, this is devolved only to Northern Ireland currently, and for reasons I will come to, this may prove relevant and useful. On top of this, we in Northern Ireland are genuinely world leaders in the manufacture and marketing of medicines and research involving clinical trials, both of which are, were placed hugely at risk by Brexit. We have already seen pharmaceutical operations shifting over the border to ensure they are still within the EU. Again, there is an opportunity here to emphasise that there is at least the potential that this does not need to happen. In my view, Northern Ireland can potentially at least remain a fully regulated supplier to the EU market. We need to be clear that, as an enabling bill, the actual issues of medicine supplies will remain in our hands. Emergency supplies of medicines is rightly handled in a distinct way. Ultimately, however, what we are enabling is maintenance of the status quo, world-class regulation combined with local control. This is not to say my colleagues and I have no issues with this motion. We are concerned that current circumstances did not enable proper scrutiny, as has been mentioned already this evening, of the legislation and its impact, which, although it is enabling, is nevertheless specialist. It is frustrating that we have not had enough time to properly engage with the pharmaceutical society or indeed with the pharma sector in general. Nevertheless, relevant future regulations should be subject to appropriate scrutiny and consultation of that nature. This brings in exactly what the impact of the UK's withdrawal, withdrawal from the EU legal framework scheduled for the end of the year will be, both on provision and on supply of medicine. Notably, under the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol of the Withdrawal Agreement, which applies regardless of any trade deal or extension, paragraph 20 makes it clear that European Community Code um, relating to mesid, um, oh God, sorry, medicine products for human use um, and similar measures, including those on good clinical practice in clinical trials, continues to apply in Northern Ireland. Additionally, so does the regulation concerning the compulsory licensing of patents relating to the manufacture of pharmaceutical products for export to countries with health, public health problems. Therefore, to a large extent, EU standards will continue to apply to the sector here. With regard to clinical trials, this will present challenges because we will remain subject to the management of the UK-wide medicines and healthcare products regulatory agency. I hope this essentially means that work across the UK, at least, with regard to clinical trials, will remain aligned, and this is clearly in everyone's interest. 
This is why we may be glad that this issue is devolved, because there is a challenge ultimately of potential east-west divergence in medicines regulation, including falsification. Conversely, this provides a significant potential opportunity for pharmaceutical companies and clinical trials based in Northern Ireland because as they will continue to apply most EU standards and products will therefore continue to be exported freely. The benefits of EU single market membership in those sectors will largely still apply. This does not mean that it is anything other than frustrating that we are having to take up time dealing with this at all. This is the unnecessary bureaucracy of Brexit that still has no clear, clear benefit from doing any of this. Hard-pressed departmental officials, for example, have had to take up extra time just at the moment when they are under extreme pressure with COVID-19 to manage this motion and the consequences of the issues around it. Their time would be far better spent focused on rebuilding and reconfiguring our health services without any further complications, potential or otherwise. Therefore, we can see the challenges ahead arising not from the bill itself, but from the circumstances which make it necessary. Nevertheless, we must also try to find the opportunities inherent in being able to chart our own path while adhering to the standards of the largest multinational single market in the world. Fundamentally, however, today's motion is about approving an enabling bill, which will, as far as possible, leave things as they are on these vital matters, while at the same time allowing for important scrutiny of future decisions on these vital matters in the hands of those elected in this House. Therefore, it is, this motion has my support. Thank you. I call Alan Chambers. Mr Deputy Speaker, I wasn't really intent to speak uh, uh, on the issue, but Certainly my party uh, would be supporting uh, the motion before the House tonight. Um, in relation to the Health Committee meeting, the Chairman quite rightly uh, reported that the Committee uh, was unable to uh, come to a conclusion uh, to support it. Uh, but I think it is only fair to point out that, in fact, the Committee was split 4-4 uh, right down the middle on it, so it certainly, uh, if that uh, conveyed that it was some sort of unanimity uh, within the Health Committee, there wasn't. Uh, the, the Committee was divided on it. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, I just want to refer to Brexit, and I know that we keep hearing this mantra that Northern Ireland voted against Brexit. Now, I voted to remain. I voted in a UK-wide referendum. It was not a regional headcount. Nobody ever suggested it was a regional headcount. It was a UK-wide vote, and the nation spoke. As a Democrat, I accepted the decision, and I can't understand how others who call themselves Democrats are still in some form of denial. Thank you. I call Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I rise to speak and support the legislative consent motion before us today. The bill derives from the UK's decision in 2016 to withdraw from the EU. Matters covered by the bill have been within EU competence for the duration of the U UK's membership of the EU. So basically, we are agreeing to what's already in place. The Medicines and Medical Devices Bill comprises of 45 clauses and two schedules. was introduced in the House of Commons on the 13th of February 2020. Human medicines and veterinary medicines are a transferred matter. The main regulations transposing the EU legislative framework on human medicines were enacted on a UK-wide basis. Once the European Communities Act 1972 is repealed at the end of December 2020, a new power in primary legislation would be required to continue updating or amending these regulations. The Medicines and Medical Devices Bill therefore provides replacement delegated powers to the Department of Health in respect of human medicines and to the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs in respect to veterinary medicines. As such, the bill was described to the committee as an enabling bill. In both cases, powers may be exercised by the Minister acting alone or jointly with the Minister and the Secretary of State. The motion seeks the Assembly's consent in line with the Seal Convention for Clauses 1 to 11, dealing with human medicines and veterinary medicines, which are transferred matters to extend to Northern Ireland. The Committee for Health was briefed on the background to the bill and on the nature of the power to be provided to the Department. 
Clause 1 provided the Northern Ireland Department of Health acting alone or jointly with the Secretary of State with delegated powers to make regulations in relation to human medicines. On Clause 2, the manufacturing, marketing and supply of medicines may be used to issue authorizations to manufacture, import or distribute as well as to regulate advertising, labelling and packaging. Clause 3, falsified medicines regulations may be made to help prevent the supply of medicines that uh, falsely represent in their source. Clause 4, the clinical trials powers may also be used for the purposes of authorisation, notification and report requirements of clinical trials similar to EU clinical trial regulations. On Clause 5, deals with fees, offices, powers of inspectors. In Clause 6, this gives the department powers to make regulations providing for the disapplication of human medicines in urgent situations in order to prevent serious harm to public health. The committee attention was drawn to Clause 40, which requires consultation prior to the exercise of powers in relation to both human medicines and veterinary medicines, except in emergencies as referred to. Members were assured that the bill is essentially an enabling bill. Any regulations to be made under the provisions require, requiring consent will come back to the committee for consideration in the usual way. Officials were also confirmed that human medicines regulations are updated regularly, usually twice a year. Northern Ireland will be required to comply with EU standards and regulations to falsified medications, whereas the rest of the UK will be free to diverge. In relation to clinical trials, Officials stated that the MHRA would continue to manage in this area. Officials confirmed that issues around the supply of and access to medicines were being addressed as part of the preparation work to, to go ahead. The Health Committee acknowledges that in recent months the Department of Health has been under enormous pressure to deal with COVID-19. However, due to the short time available for consideration, the committee decided it was not in a position to come to a decision to support the motion. I have to say I am disappointed in some of the parties opposite who could not bring themselves to support this at the committee stage, which I find strange because um, the Dura committee were able to agree for this to come forward. Um, and I do find it strange that uh, we as an assembly can't agree for regulations and to ensure that these regulations and the safety of our medicines are are put forward for the safety of our people, and I find it bizarre that we can't support that uh, at the committee stage. But thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I call Matthew Till. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I'm not an expert, I have to say, on either medicines regulation or um, veterinary medicine regulation. Um, for those who think the UK was taking back control when it voted to leave, on the 23rd of June 2016, they might want to note that until fairly recently there were a lot of experts on medicines and medicines regulation based in the UK because the, Europeans medicines, the European Medicines Agency was based in London, in Canary Wharf. Uh, London was the headquarters of the regulation of all pharmaceutical production across the European Union. Not anymore, they've left. Other capitals bid to host the headquarters and uh, I can't remember, I think it was Amsterdam that was ultimately successful, I think Dublin did as well. Um, I use that as an example because it is utterly absurd to have members of this House on the opposite side imply that this is somehow about taking back control or there's some sort of serious, th 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 this LCM and the bill that it's attached to offer some kind of serious plausible mechanism for taking back control or there's something, or this is in some way kind of a, a, um, some great uh, mechanism in terms of medicines regulation. It isn't. This is a mopping up exercise to ensure the statute book isn't messy, or that's what we hope it is, because we don't know. Because bluntly, what this legislative consent motion does is it gives permission to the UK government to make future regulation, which we hope will be uh, aligned with uh, regulations that are helpful to, for example, our farming industry, for example, our pharmaceutical industry, and we hope will be consistent with the fair application of the Ireland Protocol. I'm deeply disappointed um, that we have so little time to debate this uh, motion today. While, as my colleague Colin McGrath said, we won't be um, uh, actively opposing 
this LCM. To be perfectly honest, there's absolutely no way I could lend my support to this legislative consent motion. It's also worth bearing in mind that those who talk about the Sewell Convention will also note that the Sewell Convention does not have um, very much by way of practical legal force. If the Assembly decided to withdraw or to withhold its legislative consent, it would not throw the statute book into chaos. It would simply require the UK Government to do what it has done before, which is just override uh, a, devolved a devolved Assembly or a devolved legislature saying it does not give its consent. They did that a couple of weeks ago, whenever this Assembly passed a motion uh, calling for an extension to the transition period, they simply ignored us after years of Boris Johnson, Michael Gove, and indeed their predecessors. Some, when I was still working there as a civil servant, so I know, I know their, uh, I know what they've been saying for the last few years in terms of the consent of this place. We withheld our consent for that. Um, so perhaps the minister will give us an update. And I, and I don't speak today. Uh, following on from Mr Nesbitt's intervention, I don't speak today to get at the, 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 the individual minister. He's been working extremely hard um, on dealing with COVID-19. I don't think anyone in this House would take that away from him. Uh, his, his work rate is, is admirable and his intentions are very good. But this LCM is, um, I'm afraid, something that I can't actively support. Um, the idea that it's somehow good for Northern Ireland to simply, um, and for this Assembly, to simply, in a Potemkin way, like a Potemkin Parliament, nod along like dogs at this um, uh, LCM going through, is, I'm afraid, pretty rich. Um, so, while we won't actively be opposing it, I'm afraid it's very, very difficult to support. There are many, many clauses in this bill, as several others in, um, in this Assembly have said, both the Chair. Um, Declan McAleer, the chair of the Agriculture Committee, and Colin Gildon, you from the Health Committee, have both pointed out there are several unknowns. There are known unknowns, uh, to, to, to quote a former US Defence Secretary, known unknowns in that we don't know how they'll interact with the operation of the Ireland Protocol, a protocol that whatever happens in the UK EU negotiations will be legally binding on this Assembly at the end of this year. On New Year's Day next year, 2021, unless there is an extension, it will be legally binding that protocol on us. And we have no idea how this bill really – that is what, that's what the, the committees have had to say, and, and, and fair play to them for being frank about it – they have no idea how it will interact with the protocol or the application of it. They do not know, and we do not know what, what decisions the UK Government will make in relation to diverging uh, on an east-west basis. We can't pretend that we can simply take the word of the UK government uh, in terms of divergence on an east-west basis. And I don't say that as a as a dig at the UK government. I don't say that just as a kind of um, a, a sort of nationalist kick at them. I say that because they've done it before. Particularly this particular government. We know that they've broken faith with politicians here. People in the party opposite should know that because the prime minister uh, today went to his their party conference not so long ago and made them a promise that he later broke. Well, I'm afraid, guys, if, the, um, if he's willing to break that promise, then I would say officials in the UK Department of Agriculture, and indeed, um, and I don't say to get at officials, I used to be an official, so, uh, but that uh, ministers in the UK Department of Agriculture will uh, hold to, to all their promises in terms of consistency of regulation. So I'm not going to go through the detailed clauses. I'm not going to oppose uh, this LCM in practice, but I certainly can't support it. And I think it's deeply depressing that when it comes to Brexit legislation and Brexit detail, we're using it at the last. We're, we're squeezing it in at the last of a plenary day when we've been debating other matters. This should be, as we come out of the COVID crisis, our biggest priority: ensuring that we get this right and giving it proper scrutiny. We need to do better. I'm afraid. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I call Jerry Carl. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, earlier today, I raised concern about how bills and legislation have been repeatedly brought to the House without maximum time uh, or scrutiny um, or adequate time to uh, answer concerns from members uh, in relation to the issues uh, in front of the House. And I think today is a vivid illustration of that precise point. Um, Mr Nesbitt will be glad to, to hear it's not just about the Minister uh, here uh, today uh, or the Ministers, but I think it's a general uh, trend that's been happening throughout this coronavirus uh, crisis. Um, and I think the stuff we're dealing with today is, is very serious and important stuff. Um, I, I don't claim to be an expert in uh, medicine or medical devices either, uh, but um, manufacturing, marketing and supply of medicines seems to be serious stuff uh, indeed to me. Uh, clinical trials are obviously detailed in Clause 4, 
And as we heard on the Health Committee, it could provide the possibility of things like medicinal cannabis trials and, and other uh, things that activists and campaigners um, like uh, Charlotte Caldwell and many others have been camp campaigning for. Uh, but it has to be approached with some level of caution. And, and I am certainly uh, cautious uh, and when I hear talk of red tape and bureaucracy. Um, to me, that sounds like code word for stripping back and measures which need to be in place to protect the public uh, in regards to uh, clinical trials and medicine more, more generally. Uh, and I'm concerned as well that, um, as other members have indicated, that we're being asked to, to rubber stamp to just endorse uh, a, an LCM without having the full detail uh, at hand, um, the full detail of what we're voting on. Uh, and uh, any consequences, detailed con consequences, intended or unintended. Uh, and as, as the Chair said, the Health Committee uh, was asked to make a decision on this uh, and didn't for a number of, of reasons. Um, the main being that members, or uh, for them at least, uh, decided that they didn't have enough detail on, on various questions raised. And I think that's serious stuff uh, indeed. Uh, for my part, I raised a number of concerns, but the main one was um, in relation to having a detailed list on the limits, um, setting out the limits of devolved authority and what matters would remain in London. Uh, the committee uh, received a report back uh, from the department, and I quote, um, it was advised that this was a complicated field and that a comprehensive list could not yet be provided, but uh, officials are working, our officials are working through the issues. And no doubt the officials are working hard, the ministers working hard, whatever disagreements they have with them. Um, but it's not good enough uh, for members in the legislature to be told that uh, we don't have the issues, they don't have the detail at hand. That's simply not good enough for good practice, for democracy, and for people to cast their vote in, in a clear, uh, accurate um, way. Um, and also, I'm concerned that the memorandum we received from the department uh, stated that there was no consultation on this LCM, uh, and of equal concern is the fact that we're told that there are no human rights concerns from this. That may well be the case. But how do we know this if we didn't consult the people who are involved in human rights work and human rights activism and those people who could direct could be, I emphasize, could be impacted by this uh, LCM. So, uh, like others, Mr Deputy Speaker, I cannot give my consent uh, to this LCM and not be blocking it. Uh, but I notice that there are two ministers in this House. I would implore them and ministers across the executive to ensure that any further debates on legislation that their departments provide as much detail as possible. I think it's essential going forward. Thank you. I now call on Robin Swan, the Minister of Health, to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, can I just say in the outset that I have noticed a number of speakers here tonight that expanded this debate on the LCM into the, the detail and the complexity of Brexit, I think, without actually having read the LCM and the content itself and what it was actually meant to do. So there, there is this place, there is a place for, for that debate and it should be expanded at a wider time and another time. But tonight my focus is on this LCM in regards to to what it is about to do. Um, and, and I do note those in this House who are not able to support this LCM but won't oppose it. And you know, I, I thank them for taking that, that decision. Um, and I thank all the members who have contributed here today. Um, just in regards to, to a number of, of commentators um, and a number of speakers, to the chair of the Health Committee, um, in regards to, I, I suppose, the the assurance of the draft affirmative action on regulations or any amendments he has that that was given him, it was given that the committee has been given in my speech today. So any changes that do have to be made or will be done under the draft affirmative action. So this house does have control of what comes out of this LCM. So for those who seem to indicate or seem to be under the belief that this is solely given something to the powers in Westminster, it's not. It allows this house to make those decisions. And I think it was uh, Ms Bradshaw's comment of a world-class industry, but with local control and regulations. And I think that sums up what the thrust of this LCM is actually about. In regards to, to the other issue, I will. Thank the Minister for giving way and um, indicate my full support, um, because there's a veterinary medicines element to this uh, for his actions and that he works with our department's support in bringing forward this LCM. It is the only way forward 
and for those who are, are suggesting otherwise, um, there is not another way forward and they haven't proposed another way forward. I'd add to this that we will rely, I assume on his part, but certainly on ours, um, on expertise that currently exists in Great Britain that we don't have here going forward. And there is a, a skill base that exists there and a quantity of people um, within that personnel um, that are hugely useful to us in this um, relatively small pool of people uh, to deliver on some of these issues. So we will continue to have a very close working relationship um, with the United Kingdom um, after this is over. Thank the member for, for his intervention and, and the support coming from his department. Uh, also in commentary from the, the chair of the health committee, there was a reference he referred to the clinical trials and the importance, and, and what I see is the importance of Northern Ireland um, being fully involved. And again, um, I think it was Mr McGrath talked about the ramifications. And the ramifications of us not being involved in this LCM or the clinical trials are, are actually quite extant. Because if the member looks to where we are today to an announcement um, where a clinical trial uh, that was actually, impo or actually operated across the, the whole of the United Kingdom for a drug called dextamethasone, an anti-inflammatory drug, which is actually proven now to be groundbreaking in regards to how we treat COVID. And it has proved to reduce the risk of dying in COVID-19 patients on ventilation by as much as 35% and patients on oxygen by 20%. So that's the ramifications of Northern Ireland not being involved. Allowing somebody else to do that work and to take those risks. That's not where I think we should be. We should be part of, of doing that work and benefiting from the, the results that are that, that I'd work from that. Yeah. Thank you very much, the Minister, for giving way. This is just a, um, a basic a, just a point of information. Would he agree with me that the Sewell Convention, which is what um, uh, governs legislative consent motions within the United Kingdom and the devolved legislatures has no legal force. So if we, would, if we did not give our legislative consent motion, the UK government could still, it wouldn't stop this legislation going through Westminster or having binding force in Northern Ireland. But, uh, and I thank the member in regards to, to the Sewell Com Convention. Now, my understanding of this specific LCM, and I'll get officials to verify it with them, Northern Ireland is the only part of the United Kingdom where this is a devolved authority. So it's, it, it actually sets slightly outside Sewell because it doesn't have the same effect on Scotland or Wales because this is not a devolved issue to them. This is solely an LCM that is solely within our power and our gift. So we could set outside it. And as I said to the member earlier on in regards to, you know, it's, I think when we, we, the debate was expanded into the wider Brexit point, I'm here to discuss this specific LCM. So as about the knowledge of this LCM, I think is important in, in tonight's debate. Uh, to, to regards of some of the, the, the comments from the chair of the ERA committee, and again, comments that has been made by, by other members, is the importance again of noticing that this is an enabling bill. This allows us to make the decisions. And that's where I see as a devolved, as a devolved minister, as a devolved elected representative, that's where I want to be. And again, I think the, ch the chair of the ERA committee was right when he noted that this LCM is necessary to bridge that gap once we, we do leave the, the European Union. Yeah. Um, I understand that uh, the Minister and perhaps the DERA Department as well had requested that the Department of Health um, across the water would amend the bill at source, thereby potentially obviating the necessity for an LCM. Can you shed any light on as to why the Department of in Britain weren't minded to, to adopt that route? I think in regards to, to where we are in time, because as, as I said in my opening comments, this will be moved to, to our understanding the earliest, the 18th of June. Now, it may be delayed by a couple of days, but there's not that time to do that. The member makes a valid point, but, but time is against us to make sure that we bring the powers of this LCM and this legislation back into this house where it could be. Uh, in regards to, to Mr McGrath's comments, in, in regards to the ramifications, I think I've covered that. In regards to where we are with with the devolved powers, with being able to be involved in those, those drug trials as well. Um, and again, to, to Paula Bradshaw's comments, again, on further ramifications, to our pharma industry. You know, when we talk now of the recovery coming out of COVID and industries that we need to support and want to support, you know, pharma is one of our main industries. So the implication 
of not passing this LCM tonight, either through opposing it or not, not being able to support it, I think is something that members should, should take, take note of. Um, in, in regards to... to yeah. It's just to make the, the, the point that you know, the reason that we're having the LCM is because it's necessary because of Brexit, so therefore any of the objections to Brexit is the objections to having the LCM. But the actual timing of it, the fact that we don't know, we didn't have time in the committee to give it the consideration, that that is why we're not approving it here this evening. It's not because we necessarily disagree with the LCM and what it will actually do. It's the fact that we haven't had the proper time to scrutinise what the impact of it would be or to listen to the sector. And it's just that the objections on the ground of Brexit are because that's why we're actually having the LCM full stop, but that there is a difference between the two objections. I, I think maybe, maybe in, in the member's commentary and also that of, of his party colleagues, I, I was getting the feel that the, the inability to support this LCM was more to do with a stance on Brexit rather than anything that's actually entailed, entailed in the bill. And in regards to, to commentary, and I think it was... Yeah. just point out that, that, as I said in my remarks, um, we, we, we in committee did not oppose the LCM. We, we pointed to the fact, and we acknowledge the department is under pressure, but will you acknowledge that the department could have led this LCM at an earlier stage with our committee and allowed us to give it better consideration? No. And I think the, the chair of the committee, and maybe the chair will be able to reflect that I didn't mention the committee or even his party. In my last comment, when I said where I got the feel of, of not being able to support this bill was coming from, um, or this LCM. In regards to, 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 to Mr. Carl's point, you know, in regards to, to serious stuff, yes, it is. That what, what this allows us to continue to do as a devolved assembly is necessary, but as, a, as I go back again, I will point out it is important to make the point that the requirement for the draft affirmative procedure will ensure that this assembly has the proper opportunity to scrutinise and debate any regulations before they are approved. So it's not a matter of, of us as a department or, or me as a minister or even the Minister of Agriculture under his remit uh, railroading stuff through. So I would, also, I would like to take this opportunity to thank both the Health Committee and the Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee for taking the time to examine the Legislative Consent Memorandum and for their helpful and positive engagement with Department officials on this matter. And I appreciate that the Committee has had to work with a very challenging timescale. And I would like to thank them for their patience and their understanding and their cooperation with both Departments. I would also like to thank my Executive colleagues for their support in this matter and for agreeing to the need for a Legislative Consent Motion in relation to the Bill. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would point out that in the executive, I had support of all my executive colleagues in bringing forward this LCM. Mr Speaker, I would know that some members would hold the view that as a matter of principle, any legislation that falls within the devolved competency of the Northern Ireland Assembly should, when possible, be made by the Assembly. Whilst I would fully agree that the view it is important to understand that it would not have been possible to progress separate primary legislation for Northern Ireland within a similar time scale. For that reason, I believe that on this occasion it is appropriate and indeed makes good sense for Westminster to legislate on matters that are devolved to the Northern Ireland Assembly. In very practical terms, new primary legislation is needed to replace the broad regulation making power which is currently available in Section 22 of the European Communities Act 1972, and it is important that Northern Ireland is included within the provisions of the Medicines and Medical Devices Bill. Mr Speaker, as I stated early, earlier, the Medicines and Medical Devices Bill will provide us with the necessary powers to ensure that Northern Ireland can use subordinate legislation to bring forward any necessary amendments to the regulatory regime for human medicines and veterinary medicines. It is also important to re reiterate that the Bill is not a new set of delegated powers, but simply replaces one set with another. I consider this as an important measure which will provide Northern Ireland with necessary delegated powers to replace Section 22 of the European Communities Act 1972. Mr Deputy Speaker, I commend the motion to the House. <clears throat> Members, the question is the motion standing on the order paper is agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The next item in the order and paper is the adjournment 
But before I put the question, I would remind members that the next meeting uh, of the plenary sitting of the Assembly will be on Tuesday the 23rd of June. The question is, Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly